Okay, so today I'll be reading about the ear, um, the outer, middle, and the inner ear. So uh, that's it for this one. Um, and I've put up a background, the background picture as, um, sorry, I put up what the, the, the things in the ear for your reference because there's going to be a lot of like that stuff going on and I'll be reading like three four pages but there are a lot of figures so yeah anyways so the ear outer and middle ears conventionally the ear is divided into three regions for descriptive purposes the outer middle and inner ears the outer ear consists of the pinna or external flap which is mainly cartilage covered with skin the concha which surrounds the opening opening to the canal um, the external auditory canal or meatus and the eardrum or tympanic membrane which covers the far end of the canal so that's outer Middle ear is an air-filled chamber which contains three articles or little bones. These are the malleus or hammer attached at one end to the tympanic membrane and at the other to the incus or anvil, which in turn is attached to the staves or stirrup. The foot blade of the stirrup is attached to a membrane in the oval window and opening into the cochlea on which it acts like a piston. The function of the mechanical components in the outer, outer and middle ears is to funnel, filter, amplify, and transmit the movements of the air, which constitute a sound wave to the cochlea. So outer and middle ears function are to funnel, filter, amplify, and transmit sound wave, basically, to the cochlea. Anyway. Because sound waves are reflected off and within the pinna, it acts as a filter which is selective for the frequency of sound. And the resonance determined by the diameter of the concha and external canal mean that they amplify some frequencies more than others. Okay, Teranishi and Teranishi, I don't know if, I don't know what kind of name that is anyway and Shaw, 1968, showed that a band of frequencies centered on 4.7 kHz and ranging from about 2 to about 9 kHz was amplified when the microphone was placed in the external ear canal rather than in a flat reflecting plate. The structures of the middle ear overcome a problem caused by the difference in the physical properties of air and water of which the fluid which fills the cochlea is mostly composed whose resistance to movement or impedance impedance is resistance to movement differs by a factor of about 3880 it has been calculated from this difference that if the tympanic membrane rather than a membrane covering the oval window were directly con connected to the cochlea over 99% of the energy in sound waves reaching the tympanic membrane would be reflected back down the external ear canal. The difference in impedance is reduced by three processes. So process one, the area of the average human tympanic membrane is much greater than that of the foot plate of the staves. Oh my god, is this more physics? What the hell? The force acting on the membrane of the oval window is increased from that produced by the tympanic membrane by the ratio between these two ears, eh, sorry, areas. Second process. How is that? Wait, hold on. How is that a process? What? So you're just saying area of a tympanic membrane is greater than the foot plate of the staves and then the force acting on the membrane of the oval window? Well, is that the process? The force acting on the membrane of the oval window? Um, whatever. Okay, anyway, the second process. The malleus and incus are connected by a hinge joint and the incus to the staves by a fused joint. Uh, yeah, malleus connected to incus, incus connected to staves. Like a stair. Yeah. The length of the malleus is about 6.2 millimeter and that of the incus of about 4.5 millimeter. It's that important? I don't know. The arrangement 
acts as a lever to reduce the displacement and so increase the force on the oval window by the ratio between two lengths. Um, okay, I don't understand. Anyway, the third air quotes process. The tympanic membrane is fixed at its edge, however, its maximum displacement occurs not at its center, but about midway between the center and the edge. This buckling creates a lever, bleh, lever effect, which increases the force um, at the center by a factor of about two. <laughs> this book is just talking about physics. This is not working for me, I swear. I wish I can, like, sell this back, but I already, like, <laughs> scribble on it with pen so you know never mind together these three processes give an overall increase in pressure at the oval window of a factor of about 45 or 32 decibels which is about three decibels below complete compensation for the losses caused by impedance impedance mismatching transmission of sounds by the ossicles is affected by differences in pressure within the middle ear chamber and the surrounding atmosphere. This is controlled by the eustachian tube, which runs from the middle ear to the nas nasopharynx. Um, that's the place uh, uh, around your nose, if I'm not mistaken, and is normally closed by the tensor valley muscle. Um, it is open during yawning or swallowing, which is why swallowing after takeoff in an airliner can change the quality of sound in the slightly depressurized ca cabin. Deterioration of hearing, in which the operation of the ossicles is impaired, is called conduction deafness. So I hope that makes sense to you. I don't know how it would. Doesn't make sense to me. Anyway, so let's move on to the inner ear. Um... We're, yeah, we're halfway done. Don't worry. Anyway, the structures forming the inner ear lie in cavities in the temporal bone of the skull. The vestibular sense of organs and their operation in controlling balance and other functions to do with bodily orientation are, oh, discussed in chapter 9, whatever. The structure in which me mechanical vibration of the ossicles are converted into electrical impulses in the, is the cochlea. Yeah, you can see the cochlea uh, in, the, in, the, in the picture, I hope. Anyway, <laughs> um, a coiled tube which looks like a snail, so giving the structure its Latin name. Yeah, that's important. Anyway, if the two and a half of three turns of the spiral cochlea are uncoiled, it is about 3 cm, 3 centimeters long. The, uh, da, da, da. Within the uncoiled tube are three ducts. The upper scala vestibuli, the lower scala tympani, and between them the cochlear duct or scala media. When the stapes is moved to and fro in the oval window, the flexible membrane over the round window allows movement. In the perilymph, in the perilymph, oh okay, the fluid which fills the scala vestibuli and the scala tympani. There's a lot of figures, so. Whatever. Movement in the perilymph is transmitted to the endolymph via the thin vestibular membrane which forms the roof of the cochlear duct. This in turn produces movement of the basilar membrane which transmits the movement to the perilymph in the scalar tympani. Movement of the basilar membrane stimulates hair cells in the organ of cordy which lies on the basilar membrane under the tectorial membrane. So, um, okay, uh, okay, okay, I have a figure so that makes more sense. So, tectorial membrane is like the top part and that basilar membrane is like the under part. Uh-huh, and then you have hair cells in the middle. Okay, never mind. The organ of cordy contains four rows of hair cells which run along the whole length of the cochlea. Some of the stereocilia of the hair cells are in contact with the tectorial membrane, which is relatively immobile because it is fixed to the bony wall of the cochlea. When movement occurs in the basilar membrane, the stereocilia are displaced. Movement in one direction causing depolarization of the cell, in the other hyperpolarization. So, what does that mean? Um, I know polarization is like when you're attracted to one group, attract to something 
like you kind of get pulled by it. So depolarization means not getting pulled by it, I guess. Anyway, depolarization causes neurotransmitter, probably glutamate, release in a graded fashion. And sufficient transmitter causes an action potential in the sensory nerve. Okay, the single row of hair cells, known as inner hair cells, because they are nearest to the inner side of a cochlear spiral. Uh, so that's why it's inner. I've been wondering why it's called outer and inner when they're placed about the same exact height. Um, but I've been looking at it from like the top down, but it's really like from uh, left to right perspective. Anyway, so because they're nearest to the inner side of the cochlear spiral, has different properties from those of the three rows of outer hair cells. Most of 30,000 afferent sensory fibers are connected to the approximately 3,500 inner hair cells, which thus appear to be largely responsible for conveying information about sounds to the brain. The 15,000 or so outer hair cells are thought to actively regulate the sensitivity of the cochlea. Their depolar depolarization, produced by movement of the basilar membrane, produces a fast contraction of the cell, which causes movement of the basilar membrane, amplifying its vibration locally, and narrowing the extent over which it vibrates. Brodel, 2004. Um, movement of the states cause a wave to travel along the basilar membrane from its basal region near the oval window to its apex in the helicotrema. The point on the basilar membrane at which the, the displacement is greatest depends on the frequency of movement of the states and so of the sound which causes it. The point on the basilar membrane so the displacement is greatest depends on the frequency of the movement of the state. Uh, this is so hard to pronounce. I'm sorry. And kind of, okay, I should stop saying how hard it is to like understand because that's probably getting in the way of me understanding stuff. Okay. Anyway, um, uh, this arises because of the mechanical properties of the membrane, which increases in both its width and its flexibility with distance from its basal region. This means that maximum displacement for high frequency sounds occurs near the base and for low frequency sounds near the helical trimmer. Thus, the basilar membrane achieves the frequency to place conversion or tonotopic representation of incoming sounds. Uh, okay, so that's it. I'm not going to read much more. There's a lot more. So next one, we're going to talk about neuroprocesses in hearing um, and properties of auditory neurons. Yeah. And after that, probably encoded frequency. Oh my god, I'm not going to read that. Oh my god. Oh my god. This is just like one lecture. Oh my god. Ah, I'm freaking out. I have to explain these processes, you guys, and I don't understand any of it. I have to explain and comment, and I don't know how to do that. I, I don't know if I will keep on doing this, I swear. Maybe not this book, maybe my lecture notes, because eff it, I don't understand this book. I've been reading this the whole semester, and I don't understand it. Ah! <laughs> ah! Okay, anyways. anyways, that's all from me. I don't know why you're listening to this, but thank you, I guess, for listening. Uh, sorry for wasting your time, but then you choose to click on this and then hear it until the end of it, so uh, I probably signed up for it. Anyways, thanks for signing up for it. <laughs> okay, bye.